God's church is catching fire. Are you bored with your life? Are you suffering church hurt? Disappointed? Tired of the social club and the unanointed services? Well, you can go ahead and get yourself ready for this radical change. You're going to love what God is about to do in the church. And you are right that most of the churches are lukewarm. They're dead. Most of them are. She's been broken, but, but may I assure you that God loves her, and he's fixing her now. Don't give up on her. She'll be just fine, and so will you and I. But I want to help fix the church, amen. I want to help her get on her feet again. I don't want to criticize her, throw her under the bus, kick her to the curb. God didn't do that to me, and I don't want to be doing that to her. I used to do that to her. Beating up on God's bride, that's not good. But I used to be that, critical of the broken church. But I want to tell you that a revival fire is sweeping the nations right now, and she'll be drenched in the Spirit of God, soaked in the love and the kindness of God. See, God will have His way with the world and the global revival is about to spread throughout the church of Jesus Christ, and it's going to reach every nation on the planet. Did you know this? Did you know it? Did you know that God is doing this? And we'll be a people who resemble the laser-focused, powerful church that we read about in the Bible. And right now, and I want to get into some meat here. Right now, Melinda, you know this. Right now, and see again, we're not being critical. We're not being critical because a critical spirit is not the spirit of Christ. We're not being critical, but right now you can't tell the difference in most churches in the world. When you compare the world to most churches, you cannot tell a difference. But I want to assure you, that God's going to draw that line of demarcation in our generation. And He's going to do it with loving people that are not critical. They're not beating people up, trying to drag them to church. I'm telling you, the Spirit is brooding over this generation. <clears throat> and there will be a clear line of demarcation. You will know who God's people are and who God's people are not in this generation. The fire of God and the passion for God, that no, the zeal that's in God's heart for His people, it will be fully manifest in our generation. We're going to see it. You can take heart, you can press in, and you can, you can just go ahead and get excited about it. Because I want to tell you, for me, I'll tell you this, I've been longing for this for so long that it's really all I know. And I could have gotten really discouraged a long time ago because, you know, it's just not the going thing to preach like this. I don't know if you know that. But we're forerunners. We're pioneers, and we have to do a work. We have to do a work. Fire and the justice of God is doing this work through us. God's raising thousands of presence-driven churches online, offline. It doesn't matter to God. Listen, if you're, if you're taking people to Jesus, if you're online or if you're in a hut in Egypt or if you're in a, uh, 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 a, uh, a, a mega church in Los Angeles, it's all the same to God. Are you leading people to Christ? Amen, really, in a real way, not a religious way, not a form, but if you're leading people if you are imparting the gift of the anointing and you're discipling people the way Jesus does, he, he don't care if it's in person or on a phone. It's all the same to God. He's raising up thousands of these presence-driven movements online, offline, in huts, wherever. <laughs> Amen. And these chosen ones, they're going to reorder God's house on God's terms. And that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the justice of God, the justice of God that is going to have his way in his church. He determines what he does on the earth, and the justice of God is shifting the church back to the 
uh, book of Acts and back to the early church. And there will be pure joy. There is pure joy. I mean, look at this church this morning, all these testimonies of healing and testimonies and worship. These guys, I'm looking at Holly worshiping and weeping, and I'm thinking, boy, these guys are just committed. They, pure joy, signs and wonders, healing and deliverance, destiny equipping. These apostolic fivefold movements that God's putting in the nations, the anointed prophetic preaching in these end time houses of prayer. This has been what's missing. This is why most of you have been disenchanted. You, you kind of just got sick of church because really you read the Bible and you go, that's not happening here at this church. I, I'm confused. But in order to accomplish this transition, there must be a leader shift. And this is what we're talking about today. There must be a leader shift. God is raising up Davids. These are men and women after God's own heart. Thousands of them. These anointed leaders, they're selfless. They seek God and they do things God's way. They uphold the holy order of God while faithfully serving his precious sheep. And this divine reordering will require a divine replacing. David will replace Saul now. And only this is going to fix God's broken church. So I'm speaking to David. I'm speaking to you, man, woman, or child. Beloved, listen, rise up, David. Rise up and take your place. This is, this is your time, and you've got work to do. We've got work to do. The Bible says in Acts chapter 322, God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David. Listen to this. God says, listen to this. I have found David, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Is that your heart? If that's your heart, then God can use you. Beloved, if that's not your heart, you can't be used in this act of restoration that God's doing in the nations. Point number two on page two, we're sorry that you have, and if you have church hurt, we're sorry. You're not alone, though, and we know how you feel. See, we've designed this church family with all that we have, all our time, all our resources, to be a healing home and a resting place for you and your family. And that's the will of your Father in heaven. And the reason we're talking about this right now is because the Lord was showing me this week in prayer. He was showing me how that some people, they, you've been neglected and wounded by church leaders. And you need to have a healthy church. These beautiful people, Members that we have, they know this is a healthy church. It's healthy because we're healthy. The leaders are healthy, you know, and we can, we can lead it. And we're sorry that if you had toxic relationships with ministers, you know, they didn't know how to lead you. They didn't know how to love you. Many of us have been wounded by church leaders and ministers, and, but many of us have been healed here. And this healing begins when we accept the hurting ones into our church family. And if you're a guest, you're in our church family. And we accept you and we love you and we want you to know the Lord the way we've come to know him. We want to give you the anointing that we have free of charge to bless and, and to, to, to love you. And then we encourage you to talk about your pain. You have to talk about your pain, and then we encourage you to forgive. You have to forgive, and you cannot slander and gossip people that have wounded you. You cannot do it. It's totally not going to work. It's not going to fly. You will defile your soul and many others if you do that. And then you begin your new relationship with our healthy church body here, and, and then you move into your true destiny. And before long, all that woundedness, it just, it, listen, beloved, I've been wounded. I've been hurt. Ministry can be the most painful thing you ever do in your life. 
If you're going to do anything good on this earth, you're going to have critics. You're going to have skeptics. You're going to have enemies. You don't even want enemies. You don't make them your enemies. They're just going to come out of the woodworks. And this is a word for you. I got this word this morning in prayer. I I try to spend time in prayer with the Lord. One word he said, he said, ignore the naysayers in your life. He called them negative Nellies this morning. Listen, who is it in your life that speaks negatively over you? Ignore them. Ignore them. The Spirit said, you have a purpose. You have a purpose. I'm going to tell you, I do not listen to negative people. I don't even want them around me. In fact, I'll correct you if you're speaking negative about somebody else. I'll say something like, look, I love you, but I really just don't want to hear you slander your husband right now. I love you, but I really don't think you're supposed to be slandering your boss right now. I love you, but I really don't think they say, well, I'm not slandering. I'm just, no, you're slandering because you don't have the intent to try to be, uh, you know, to, to fix something. Now, many people come and they want to fix something. Beloved, are you catching this, though? Don't be a negative, Nelly. I don't ever think it's ever okay for you to speak something negative about another human being. Ever. Amen. As a pastor, I have to bring things up to staff and we have to talk about things. That's not what we're talking about. And if you've been wounded, you can come talk to us. But negative people speaking into your life will defile you. They will make you sick. Be very, very careful. Now, if you've been wounded by false shepherds, because there are false shepherds, did you know? There are false shepherds. If you've been wounded by false shepherds, you will certainly heal here. Jeremiah 23 verse 2 says, Thus says the Lord God against the shepherds who feed my people. What? That God would have something against his shepherds. That is a staggering reality to most people. How could it be, Legene, that God would say in Jeremiah 20? Now, I'm going to tell you that God spoke this scripture to me Monday last week and told me, put it in this message. Thus says the Lord God against the shepherds who feed my people. And I'm telling you, there are many pastors right now that God has something against. It says you have not attended to them. You've not attended to them. That means you've not prayed over them. You've not delivered them. You've not counseled them. You've not coached them. You don't have systems in your church that are, that are created to heal and deliver my people. He said, I got something against you because you're not attending to them. He said, but I'll gather a remnant here in the scripture. I'll gather a remnant and they will be fruitful. My people will be fruitful and increase. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them. Beloved, that's the transition that we're in right now. God is setting up shepherds. There is a replacement. God is replacing Saul with David right now. Saul leaders are being replaced by Davidic ones who have God's heart and they are going to pay attention to your needs. See, see, the difference is we've lived in a generation, right, Tammy? Watch. We've lived in a generation where you go to church and it's like, Okay, I'm here. I'm going to do my faithful duty. I'm here. I'm at church. All right? But many times, you're not noticed. You don't have a pastor that has you in a flow to connect you to the Spirit of God, to teach you to hear His voice and to know your your destiny and to walk in His ways. What What we've found is in this generation, Melinda, What we found, Alicia, is that we found after 20 years of pastoring and studying this out in prayer and fasting and reading what the prophets are saying and from the word, well, what we found is there's a leadership happening right now. We've been in this lukewarm sort of a place. Well, no wonder our children are falling away from God as soon as they leave home. Nothing's gripping their attention. The world is more alluring and powerful. How could we hold their membership? But I want to tell you the Lord's changing this. He's changing this. 1 Samuel 15, 11, the Bible says, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king, for he has not been loyal to me and has refused to obey my command. 
And I remember my early years of pastoring. I didn't know which end was up. I didn't know if I'm supposed to be a pastor like everybody else in town. And I just decided this. I said this. I said in my heart, I said, I'm just going to seek God. I'm going to have to let him tell me because I'm not seeing this book of Acts church anywhere. I said, I just, I, I got to seek God. I don't care if I spend the rest of my life seeking God. I'm going to figure out what a tr- church is supposed to look like. And then lo and behold, 20 years later, lo and behold, God's raised us up as a forerunner to help him shift the church back to the book of Acts. And I want to be loyal. He said about Sam, he said in 1 Samuel 15, 11, God said this, I'm sorry that I made Saul king. He's not been loyal to me and has refused to obey my command. And you know what he was talking about when he said, when God told him through the prophet, he said, I want Saul to go kill every man, woman, and child in every, all their livestock. That's a defiled people. Don't bring anything back into the camp. Saul did not listen to God. He listened to the people. He had fear of man and he wanted more stuff. Does that sound familiar? Covetousness, greed, and fear of man, people-pleasing, is rife in our generation. Page 3.3. Our vision is to restore order in God's church. It's our church. It's our church vision. The Holy Spirit has ordained Father Heart and many other churches to restore order back to the church. There's got to be a restoration of order. And I'll say that differently. There's got to be a a, a revolutionizing of the church. One time the Lord told me that. He said, I've called you to revolutionize modern church, modern Christianity, he said. I'm thinking, I don't even know what revolutionize means. Is it revolutionary, revolutionary, revolutionize, revolution? I don't know. I had to go look it up in the dictionary. I didn't even know what it meant. Point number four. Now, here's where we're going to get into the order of, of God. See, here's where we're going to get into the order of God, okay? Because in order to accomplish this prophetic assignment to help God restore the church, we have to explain how God has ordered the universe. We have to explain or do the best we can. We we can only stammer at it. We have to understand that God has an order for the church. He has it for the for the civil government he has it for the church, and this is where some of you that uh, that are really involved in politics, some of you are really involved in schools, some of you are really involved in uh, marketplace ministry, and you're 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 wanting you get God's called you to 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 finance, or God's called you to marketplace, and you need to know that God has order in every sphere, every sphere. Point number four. God created the world and he gave us laws. He gave us boundaries. Psalm 119.91 says, All things are your servants and the laws you made are still in effect today. All things are your servants and the laws you made are still in effect today. One of the reasons the church has lost her fire and the ability and the ability to restore, heal, and nurture God's people is because her leaders have stopped upholding the law of God within the church. And this must be restored. The tenets of this law are found in the Bible, and we do not get to omit them. And we'll be disqualified if we do omit them habitually. See, God has delegated some spiritual authority to his anointed church leaders. And if we follow them and submit to their leadership, we'll have peace and health for God's order always brings peace and health. But if we're not in spiritual order, note to self, we are, we and our family will suffer greatly. Point number five, page five. Now we keep ourselves healthy by keeping God's order. See this church, listen to this beloved. And this is, this is really boring if you're, if you're not real, like, on fire for God. You're, you're going to listen to this, and you're going to go, oh, my goodness, that's just a bunch of rules, and that's just a bunch of... But I want to tell you that this is gold. This is the gold of God right here. This is from the Bible. I'm going to give you the, some of the tenets of 
spiritual order. You must know these things because this is why children are falling away is because parents aren't delving into this and they are not upholding the order themselves. Number five, we keep ourselves healthy by keeping God's order. The quality of our church family is dependent on our understanding of spiritual authority. See, the Bible has much to say on this subject. It's so often neglected, but it is essential to every organization, large or small, spiritual or secular, to understand spiritual authority. You must understand this or nothing makes sense about what's going on right now in our world. Nothing makes sense unless you know God is in control and he's got an order and you got to learn that spiritual order. The more we understand and recognize this, the more our church and your family and your business, the more you will enjoy unity, good morale, and effective problem solving. If you don't understand the order, in other words, of a family, that the husband is the head of the wife, the wife is to be honoring and submissive, children are supposed to obey the parents, and parents are not supposed to exasperate their children. That is the order, the basic order of a family. If you don't understand that, and if everybody is not submissive to God's order, it's not my order, it's not anybody's order, if it's God's order, and if that is not intact, that family is diseased. It's diseased. Well, we're looking at the spiritual order of the church. There is order, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and the teacher. There is order in there, and we're going to talk about that today. This determines how we relate to God's authority, resulting in more blessing or conflict in our lives, in our church, or uh, in, 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 in as a member, or as a, a guest, or as a leader, a minister. Number six, point six in page five, understanding delegated authority. Understanding. You have to understand it, or you're not going to submit to it. You're not going to flow with it. All authority belongs to God. Yet he administers some of his authority indirectly through people. When God uses other people to administer his authority, we call this delegated authority. And we can distinguish between God's direct authority and his delegated authority. But to God, it's all one authority. All delegated authority represents God's authority. When Israel rejected the people that God sent with his delegated authority, they were rejecting God. Remember when, it, when Jesus sent out his disciples, he said in Matthew 10, 40, and all this is in your notes, beloved, if you want to go to our website and get the notes, all of this is in your notes. Matthew 10, 40, he who receives you receives me. That's deep. That is so deep. That's order, right, Tammy? That's order. If I, if I, if God raises me up as a prophetic minister and I'm, and I'm seeking the Lord and I'm honest and I'm accurate and I prophesy and I say things and I'm teaching the word from this platform and you say, you know, I tell you what, I'm submitting to God. That message is for me. You're not submitting to me. You're submitting to the word of God. Amen. And if you don't do what the word says, then you're rejecting not me, but him. People receive you. If you're a small group leader in this church or a coffee room leader in this church, I promise you that if there are people out of order breaking your protocols, you're the authority, and people that are out of order, they're not resisting and, 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 uh, and rejecting your protocol. They're rejecting God's because he's delegated his authority to you. And you have to see it this way or you won't understand why there's so much conflict in certain people's lives that pay no attention or they're ignorant to this. God entrusted his authority, page 6, God entrusted his authority to weak and imperfect vessels. This is many times a stumbling block. Come on, Alicia. I see you, precious. Love you, Lulu. Listen, God entrusted his authority to weak and imperfect vessels. And this is many times a stumbling block, right, Holly? Like, if you follow me along, right, Stacy? Stacy will tell you. Now, she'll say I'm perfect because I always say that about her. But it's not true. I'm a human, and I have a couple flaws, maybe more than a couple. I don't know. We didn't count. 
We can, you can ask Stacy later. But I'll tell you this. I am imperfect and I'm weak, but I'm still the head of this church. And so you as a father, you are Im, imperfect and you're weak, but you're still the head of the home. Amen. It's okay. God's best father is imperfect and weak. It doesn't matter uh, about your perfection. It really has nothing to do with the delegated authority that God says, I wrote the laws to the universe and the man is the head and the pastor is the head. They're imperfect and they're weak. We, but we recognize them by the Spirit. You see, we recognize them by the Spirit, not by their perfection and, well, are they lining up with what I think? They're, God's not interested in how we think they're supposed to line up. God's interested, are you obeying the Word? That pastor is in authority, and it's the same at, at the marketplace. I, I say it all the time, Colleen. When I walk into Walmart, there is a head over that place, and I'm not it. I cannot rearrange the grocery aisle. Amen? I can't do it. <laughs> and you can't rearrange somebody else's house. You can't range, rearrange anybody's church. You are to honor the authority. We look past people's fleshly weakness and we see the spiritual authority and calling given by God. And it's biblical to make godly appeals to those in authority over us when we can't agree with them, that's okay. We're not saying because there's a lot of abuse in the world. Like, you know, you got some churches, they just they just flaunt it over you that, you know, hey, I'm the head and you got to, you know, submit and you got to, you know, don't question anything. That, 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 that borderlines abuse. I want you to question me if you don't understand something. You have full right to question me and to ask our staff. We, are, we want to be an open book. Amen. If there's something that you don't understand or you think you get a red flag about, that is okay. There's nothing to hide. But conversely now, we expect you to be in submission and to walk in order or you can't be in this fellowship. You will not be welcome. Amen. Just like Tim, I'm looking at Tim and Melinda. If, 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 if somebody came into Tim's home and said, hey, you know, Tim, I think you need to, uh, uh, you know, you need to do a better job uh, here with your children. And you need to, uh, I think you need to do a better job over here the way the living room's arranged and do, put the couch over here and to get that table lamp over there. Tim's going to be like, dude, this is my house. What are you talking about? I, I think you need to just go ahead and leave. Amen. And that's what anybody uh, is going to do. Anybody, it's normal. That's the way God ordered it. We, the place that God gives us jurisdiction, we must stand bold and dignified in this place or people will use your authority, God-given authority against you. Colleen's house right there where she's sitting. Holly's house right there where she's sitting. That is your house. It is your domain. You make the rules and everybody else has to live with it or they can't be there. And that's the way it is. Point number seven, page six. God uses, now this is, this is, is anybody enjoying, is this helping? Wave your hands. Give me some feedback. Type something in the comments. Give me some feedback. Amen. We're, we're almost done. We've got about another, thank you, Lulu. We've got about another 10 minutes and we're going to, we're going to whiz through this. But this is God's order. It's God's order. Number seven, God uses saved and unsaved people. To govern us. Did you know that God sometimes uses unsaved parents, employers, and politicians to lead us? Sometimes he even directs them without them knowing it. Then this is one of the mysteries of God. Once I figured this out, Stephen, this made my life so much easier that God uses unsaved politicians, employers, and parents. And you can't dishonor them. He uses them Hear me, church. Proverbs 21, 1. Here's what it says. The king's heart is like a stream of water directed by the Lord, and he guides it wherever he pleases. Don't think Joe Biden's in control of anything. He's not in control of squat. Amen. We bless and we honor him because he's holding an office that God says, I appointed 
Each person that's going to sit there from the word of God says, I appointed that. Beloved, let me tell you something. He's not controlling a single thing. I promise you the Bible says the king's heart is guided by God. He takes it wherever he pleases, wherever he pleases. Amen. Now, so sometimes God uses unsaved politicians to guide us, to protect us even. Do you know that the laws of the land are protected because of Joe Biden and because of your governor and your mayor? Did you know that? God is using unsaved people. Most of you, if you're in Canada, Trudeau, God is using Trudeau, an unsaved politician, to protect your home, to protect your streets. God delegates his authority to help establish unity and protection throughout society to direct and coordinate the labors of those under them according to the corporate vision and values of any said jurisdiction. Amen. Now, in 1 Corinthians 1.10, Paul said this, I plead with you that you all speak the same thing, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind. In the same mind, somebody say the same mind, just speak it into your living room, the same mind and speak this over yourself. My family is in the same mind. All right. Watch this. My workplace is in the same mind. Watch this. My state, same mind, my nation, same mind. Don't break into all this division you're seeing everywhere and all this public slander. You get involved in that. You're breaking the code. You're breaking the law of God's spiritual order. I will assure you you're breaking the law in the church. The same mind, the same mind. If we have differences and there will be those, that's okay to have differences, but it's not okay to voice them. I don't want to tell you all the things that I don't agree with you about. And I don't want to tell other people, like if I go to Andrea and I say, Andrea, Sharon, uh, me and Sharon, we don't believe the same on, on, uh, on baptism. We don't believe the same on baptism. Me and Sharon don't believe the same on baptism. Well, what does that do? It creates a wedge. It creates the division. I don't want to go tell other people the differences I have because that's you dividing over your differences. That is not Christ-like. Right here, 1 Corinthians 1.10, Paul said, being like-minded, being of one accord, of one mind. Amen? It takes great humility, great humility to be able to agree to disagree and not be so opinionated with pride. It's an infection, that pride and self-righteousness that you know better than God. Amen. Listen to me. That you know better than God how, uh, how governments should be run. That you don't trust the word of God that says, I do what I want with, with people. They're not really in control. I guide their heart to do whatever I want. And the fact that we would dishonor them publicly on Facebook and slander them, so many Christians are doing that. I want to tell you something. I'm looking back and I'm sitting and I'm going, God is in full control of even this mess. These people that are slandering, I mean Christians that are slandering, I'm going to tell you that God... They, they are in a wilderness. They are not very pleasant to be around, and they're not having a good time in their life because they're, they've been consumed with a negative cesspool of demonic activity called slander. And it is not a healthy place to be. It's not a happy place to be, and it is not a fun place to be. And if you don't snap out of it real soon, I'm going to tell you that you could find yourself in a real deep mess. You, there's no telling how far that critical judgmental spirit can take you now one of the reasons that i require all of our staff to come to our all staff meetings and uh, i gather them together and i put a little bit of a little bit of pressure on them to meet regularly with me when i know we need to is because of this is because it it strengthens our unity our vision our values our our current emphasis and our policies. It's not good for our staff, especially those of you that are on the front line, to become disconnected spiritually or theologically from where the Spirit is leaving this movement. If we do, then divisions will naturally uh, and inevitably occur. Amen. It will inevitably 
occur. Let's go to page eight. I'm going to skip down a little bit. In, 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 uh, down to uh, page eight, third paragraph. Dishonoring authority is one of Satan's primary principles of operation. I know there's a little bit of meat. Is this meaty? Is this, is this too fiery for you, or can you handle a little bit of fire today, Andrea? Can you handle some fire? I know we're hitting on some stuff. Some of you are probably going, oh, he's talking to me. But I'm not thinking about you. I'm just thinking about just the Word of God. Is it helping? Is it helping? We need a little bit of this. Dishonoring authority is one of Satan. See, Satan wants you to dishonor your husband. Did you know this? Satan wants you to dishonor your pastor. Satan wants you to dishonor your small group leader. Satan wants you to dishonor your president. Satan wants this. I don't want to say anything negative about anybody. I don't think I have a right to. See, God can rule the world real good without me, Stacy. Real good without me. I get to, con I get to, Tammy, I get to control just a little tiny bit of my life. I probably don't even have as much to do with my life as I think I do. <laughs> when you really look at it, you know, I'm just, I, I might think I'm in control more than I am. I, I don't know how it works, but I'll tell you this. Dishonoring authority is one of Satan's primary principles of operation. I don't want any part of that. And, you know, Cain and Saul they both offered sacrifices to God. But did you know that their sacrifices were rejected? See, obedience to God and His Word and obedience to authority is more important to God than our sacrifices of ministry or money. God would rather you be obedient to honor authority than He would to, for you to fast 40 days and, and look so spiritual. Obedience is better than sacrifices. And remember that Cain and Saul, they both made sacrifices to God, but they were rejected, amen, by God in so doing. Amen. That's powerful right there, guys. You got to catch this. Now, lawlessness is powerfully at work right now. Lawlessness. I mean, look at look at the all the stuff that's going on in the in the, in the nation right now in the U.S. and other places. There's a lot of of, of uh, lawlessness, like rioting and 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 uh, and disobedience to authority. And I mean, they're even trying to deep. I, I thought I would never. I can't believe that I'm even hearing anything about this at all. About like trying to defund the police. Like what? Defund the police. Like. Like, that really makes no, absolutely no sense. Defund the police. So to defund the police looks like this. It looks like let's do away with the policemen that are protecting our homes at night and protecting our roads. Are you kidding me? Let's do away with the police. How ignorant is that? But that's lawlessness powerfully at work, seeking to bring strife and destruction to every sphere of uh, society and Jesus said that uh, that in in Matthew twenty four twelve Jesus said because lawlessness or disobedience and you know uh, rebellion will abound the love of many will grow cold that's why the love of many has grown cold the love of many has grown cold Jesus said that this would happen now let's shift in now I've given you a lot of meat about the order of God. But now let's talk about the responsibility of the leaders to serve you and not lord their authority over you. And we're going to get back into church government. Number eight, leaders eat last. Leaders eat last. The New Testament calls those who are, in, who are first in authority to be last in privilege. And even authority in the home and the workplace and the church only properly functions with a spirit uh, with a servant spirit. God appointed apostles to be first in authority in the church, but last in privilege. Look what it says. First Corinthians 12, 28. Have you ever been around a pastor that, you know, it's, you know, uh, uh, you, all of you are supposed to be serving me. You're supposed to be serving me, serve me. You know, I'm, I'm to be, I'm here to be served. Beloved. Are you, are you listening to me here real quick? Don't, don't let me lose you. I'm almost done. Listen, 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says, God has appointed these in the church, 
first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and so forth. But then look what Paul turns right around and says in 1 Corinthians 4. He says, God's appointed them first. It's the first order of the hierarchy. But then he says in 1 Corinthians 4, 9, God has displayed us, the apostles, last. We are as the last. Men condemned to death. We're made a spectacle to the world. We labor working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure it. Being defamed, we entreat. Beloved, think, think before you say yes to your calling. Because if you're a minister, you eat last. If you're a leader, you're out there on the front lines, you're defamed first, and you're eating last. That's what a true leader does. Is supposed to be. Now, here's what the Bible says in first. We're going to talk about rule, those that have rule over you in church. First Timothy 5 17 says, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. First Timothy 5 17. They rule well. Well, double honor, rule well. See, to rule speaks of bringing direction into your life. They rule by serving you. You know, and they keep the order. If things get out of whack, if things get out of whack, they keep the order. They help bring you back into, into the justice zone. They bring direction. They help you restore. You know, you, 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 you begin to, you know, get offended at your spouse, and we help you forgive your spouse. That's giving direction on how to forgive your spouse. We help you restore your marriage. And then if you, if you um, to rules also speaks of bringing, establishing the vision and the values of a church. Amen. But it also results in bringing correction into your life. Correction into your life. Well, you know, because there's sometimes where people, you know, you'll, and, and I'm going to just use this one. There's sometimes people, they, like a man will move in with a woman. And they're a member of our church. Now, most people, we don't even let you join the church if, that, if you're shacking up. But when people are in a fornicating relationship, I have to correct them. It's my job. Because that spirit of fornication and immorality will infect others. 1 Corinthians 5, it says that. It says you correct that, a little leaven leavens the whole lump, cut the leaven out so that you're a clean lump. 1 Corinthians 5. Now, of course, we rarely have to do that. I mean, it's, I can think on over 20 years of pastoring on one hand, I can count the times I've had to do that. Most people, you approach them and you tell them, hey, man, you got to get this right. You know, you cannot be in immorality and be in this church. Now, there's other things that you, you know, we're not, we don't go snooping around people and seeing if, if they're dabbling in lustful things on the Internet and things like But if you're in a fornicating or an adulterous relationship, you can't be a member of this church. I don't do it, and you can't either. <laughs> now, if you mess up, there's repentance. There's restoration. Okay, now let's talk about spiritual abuse for a minute. Oh, you're going to like me for this. All the pressure is going to get off of you now, LaJean, right? And, and on to me. Are you guys ready? All right. Spiritual abuse. Spiritual abuse. Authority, spiritual authority is abused when someone seeks to direct issues in your domestic life. I cannot tell you how to train your children. I cannot tell you how to treat your wife. I cannot intervene in how you're supposed to do and what you're supposed to be doing. Now, now if you're beating up your, 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 your husband and you're abusing him phys physically, <laughs> amen, you know, we might need to have a talk. But I can't tell you what groceries to buy. I can't tell you how to mow your yard diagonally instead of or instead of, uh, you know, squarely. I can't get involved in your domestic uh, life unless there's sin involved and you're a member of our church and it's that sort of a thing, a biblical thing. We can't, but, but many people do, don't they? 
Do, you know, there's some some pastors. I'm 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 surprised, but it happens. People tell people who to marry. Nope, you can't marry. I forbid you marrying him, Susie. Yeah, I would never tell somebody you can't marry that person. I might pull him to the side and say, um, <clears throat> "Have you met his pastor yet?" I'll give you some hints for sure because I love you. But you cannot. There is a lot of spiritual abuse in the body of Christ. They're getting involved in people's domestic life, and there's none of their business. A spiritual leader has no jurisdiction over your household. None. You don't receive that pressure, and you don't uh, invite it. And another way that spiritual authority is abused is this when authority takes more privilege and less than and they're embracing less sacrifice. I don't want to be the kind of leader that's just, just I just want honor and just people love me and I just want honor and more honor and more favor and more money and more you serve me. Man, I want to be like Paul. I you know, Paul is very clear that we're suffering for you. Amen. But that's the true, authentic version that there's a lot of abuse going on. It's abuse, maybe lower level, but it's still abuse. And then what about when people manipulate you and promise the benefits of just receiving my anointing? If you'll just carry my coat, Elisha. A lot of people abuse uh, people this way, like I'll. They manipulate people. I'll pass you my mantle if you're faithful as an armor bearer. You'll get my mantle and you'll. There's some manipulation in that and some abuse in that. That's pretty That's pretty rampant. You, you, we don't see it much in our stream, but I promise you that happens. Amen. And so. You know, we could you can read the notes. There's there's more uh, on that on page 11. And you can always go to the to the website and get these notes. Go to the go to the visit us tab where it says visit us at the on the website and then click on Sunday service and the notes are right there. I'll leave them up, for, you know, for a good portion of this week. OK. Now, let's go. Let's skip to page 13 as I get ready to wrap it up. Page 13. Go to page 13 and verse, I mean, and uh, point number 11, never speak against authority. We are commanded from the word of God not to speak evil of our leaders in the home, in church, or society. Look what it says in Exodus 22, verse 28. Exodus 22, verse 28. You shall not revile God nor curse a ruler of your people. My goodness, we need this right now. So much of the church is missing this, beloved. So much of the church is missing this. They're missing this right here. We are not to curse a ruler of our people. I'm doing good. I'm, I've only been preaching 47 minutes and I'm wrapping it up. We're doing good. Many people are cursing rulers. They're cursing their mayors, cursing their governors. By what you say, you say, well, how am I cursing them? Your president, because they're your president, you're speaking ill. You're slandering them. You got to stop. It says you shall not curse a ruler of your people. That's not just the pastors, but it is the pastors too. It's a ruler. It's your boss. It's your boss. It's your boss. It's your pastor. It's your mayor. It's your governor. It's your president. You can disagree with child murder and you and abortion, and you can hate it, but you cannot slander people over you. And I'll tell you, God commands this because he honors his own authority. He honors his own authority that he's delegated to these, even if they're unsaved and even if some of them are abominable. And, you, you, and so, you know, he commands this not to do this. To sin against the unity is to sin against God and it's to sin against God's purpose for in that, in that jurisdiction. And we're teaching our children. We, we taught uh, our children this last week. We taught our children at Thursday night small group how even if mom and dad are not perfect and making all the best decisions you have to honor them you don't just honor the best mother and father because there are no best we are all human weak and imperfect and children must honor because see here's what it really equates to it really equates to this 
if I can dishonor the pres, if I can dishonor my mayor because my mayor lets in racism and abortion, then your children can dishonor you because you're doing something wrong because you're not perfect either. Do you see how it works? If you're dishonoring authority, so will your children. It just might not be the same sphere. But if you teach them and instill honoring authority to them like the Word of God says, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. And I hear the Holy Spirit. He just said, trust. He said, trust. He said, trust. See, because it's an issue of trust. Do you trust God or do you trust what you think in your mind is supposed to be how uh, is supposed to be in order? God knows better about you. It's pride to think that we think that God can't do a good enough job to put people in authority that he wants to be there and that is supposed to be there. Amen. Point 11. Even Jesus answered the unsaved high priest to honor God's authority. He answered to honor God's authority. The unsaved high priest. Remember the story. He's being confronted and, 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 and the scripture says that he honored this unsaved high priest. The one that eventually has something to do with his cold blooded murder. And Jesus encouraged paying taxes to Caesar as a statement of submission to ungodly authority. Like, like I mean, the Bible's full of these examples. Daniel and people that submitted to ungodly authority. Amen. Do you want to be godly? You want to be sanctified? Do what the Word of God says. Now, in Titus 3.10, the Bible says, reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. We're going to get into real meat here. If there are people that divide you from your marriage, and they don't honor the sanctity of your marriage, and they're not speaking life over your marriage, you need to get some new friends. There are people that will tell you, give up on that marriage. She's not treating you right. You, could, you ought to just leave her. They are not speaking for the Lord. Yes, there may be need to be some kind of a intervention and in in counseling. But beloved, pay attention to this. Reject divisive people. Church leaders have to reject. This is what, now Paul was telling Titus this, uh, for people that are divisive within the church. The justice of God within the church, Stacy, tells us to get rid of people that are divisive. We will not let you stay in this church if you're divisive, if you gossip and you slander and you're tearing down what we're trying to build. It is impossible. You, From the word of God, we reject them after the first and second admonition. And many people go, oh, that sounds so rude. That's so crude. That's so mean. I say, no, that's justice, man. You ain't tearing down what God built. Are you kidding me? For you to think and that it's okay for you to slander or gossip and tear down and hurt somebody else. I'll have none of that. We will delicately kindly warn you once and twice and then you're out of here man i would do the same in my wouldn't you do that you're married and you got children and somebody comes in and they start attacking your children you're going to go get your butt out of my house now well, why would you think god's house is different that is justice baby and i have no problem upholding the justice here now let me calm down you can you can tell that's a soft spot with me right well guess why I've been pastoring Holly 20 years. I've, I probably still have some open wounds there somewhere, Tammy, where I need to maybe need to get you guys to counsel me. But I'm going to tell you this. The Word of God is where it's at. Why are we so happy and healthy and thriving in this church? Because we do this, every bit of it. Every bit of it. We don't leave any stone unturned. We cross all these T's and dot all these I's, baby. And we're helping a lot of folks. We're getting them healed and delivered. We love them. And so we would not let anything or anybody come in to defile that. The last point I'm going to make is on page 13. It's on page 15. 
Point 13, God sharply disciplines rebellious Christians. I want to show you from the Bible. Go with me if you want to. Numbers 16, verse 3. When Korah spoke against Moses, he angered the Lord. You think, well, you know, you put your mouth on a one of God's ministers. I, and listen, I'm going to tell you something. Even a lukewarm one, you better leave him alone. You let God do that. I got in trouble with the Lord. He would show me people, that some leaders that were lukewarm, and I stepped out there slandering them. I, I thought, well, I guess I got to tell everybody what I'm seeing. No. <laughs> I had to learn. Don't do that. When Korah spoke against Moses, he angered the Lord. It's not about obeying a leader at that point. It's about God's authority in that leader that we respect. They gathered against Moses. They were led by Korah, the Bible says. against. They gathered against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You're taking too much on yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, and every one of them, and the Lord is among them. And why do you exalt yourselves above the congregation? And Moses said, by this you'll know that the Lord has sent me. If the earth opens up it, and its mouth and swallows them, you'll understand that these men have rejected the Lord. Beloved, when you, re, when you get in the way and you begin to get in, in, in the way with what God's doing in church, and you're going to get in trouble. One time I did it. Let me tell you what happened, and I'm, 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 I'm really done. I'm in Nashville, and this lady that's a minister came against me and my team. And she was, I don't know what she was, her motive was, but she was just like, just really like just trying to just causing, she wasn't trying. She was causing like just conflict within our team. And uh, we were working with her and another ministry at the time. When she did that, I went to one of her members and I said, I just want you to know that this pastor, like she's like in the middle of stuff. And I stirred up conflict with her team. What do you think the Lord did to me? He punished me as if I'm the one that initiated it because I still retaliated and caused division. He can't stand it. I touched his anointed. Are you hearing me? I'll admit it. And he put me in a wilderness. I mean, it wasn't but just a day or two later that my team went disintegrated. Not because of this lady. The Lord said, to, he told me this, never do that again. I remember that word of knowledge. He said, never, I mean a bold word, never do that. Like a couple, two or three days later, he said, never do that again. Beloved, I had to learn, don't do that. You don't get in the middle of a ministry and put your hand, put your, put your tongue on somebody. You don't do it. Let's, let's have a come to Jesus prayer. I probably touched on about 555,000 things that you need to repent for by now just kidding but we're done you survived <laughs> i survived how can i preach on it with confidence and boldness and security and knowing that it's helping you and not hurting you how can i preach on that right there y'all let me tell you how because i've made all the mistakes I've made all the mistakes and learned from them. And God always gives you authority when you learn from your mistakes. He always does. Now you can preach what you've learned through that experience. And there's not another way to the anointed, uh, to the anointing. You have to suffer to get the anointing. And some of it is by learning through your learning how to be obey obedient through the things you suffer through the discipline and the chastening of the Lord almost everything that I've taught on today has been birthed through my failure Let's let that sink in now some of you don't have to fail as much as me you don't have to make as many mistakes and the same mistakes but you're you still have to learn through obe through you, you have to learn obedience through what you suffer hebrews 5 8 even jesus did you learn obedience through the things you suffer now let's search our heart do you need to talk to jesus and tell him i'm sorry about anything and we're going to pray for the sick we're going to heal the sick and cast demons out in just a minute i'm going to prophesy we're going to release you in just a minute after we pray this prayer but then we're going to release you if you need to go. Our church service is only two hours long. 
but our extended service after every Sunday is for the sick. If you've come here and you need healing and disease and, and deliverance, we're going to heal and deliver you today. If you need to tell the Lord that you're sorry for breaking the law of spiritual order, if there's a pastor that you've defiled, if there's somebody in authority at work, in the government, or at church, and you need to get your heart right with Jesus, I've seen it from the word today, Lord. I'm responding. I'm sorry. Tell that person, if, they, if, you've, if, if you've caused division, tell that person. Tell them you're sorry. Get it right, man. Most people are gracious and forgiving. And then if not, you tell the Lord. You ready? Repeat after me. God, I repent. I see it. Help me, Father. I'm sorry. Teach me the justice of God as it relates to church. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And I want to tell you that.